Hello and welcome to Glasgow Doors Open Day's Digital Festival. This event will begin soon, but first we have a brief housekeeping message. So that you can get the most out of this session, we'd like to point out a few features of Zoom. By clicking on the buttons at the bottom of the Zoom window, you will be able to access the chat room, and if you are in a webinar, you will also be able to make use of the Q&A function. The Q&A function is so that you can ask specific questions of the speaker, which they will be able to answer time allowing at the end of the session. Use the chat room to contribute more generally to the discussion or to share links and resources. When using these features, please mind your P's and Q's. Both will be monitored and recorded. Most sessions will be recorded and uploaded to Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival YouTube channel and website. If you're in a meeting, please make sure you keep your microphone on mute unless otherwise directed by the host. If for some reason the session ends unexpectedly or you lose connection, please just click the link again and wait to be let back in. Similarly, if the host loses connection, please bear with us. We will do our best to manage any connection issues as and when they occur and may contact you by email if necessary. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear about your experience of our digital festival. Fill in our survey to be in with a chance of winning a £100 voucher for a Glasgow local business of your choice. Our survey is available at www.glasgowdoorsopendays.org.uk forward slash survey. Thanks to our supporters, the Arlington Bass Club, Glasgow City Council and the many more, which you can find out about on the partners page of our website. We hope you enjoy this event. Hello and welcome to Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival. My name is Stephen Sheriff. I'm the festival coordinator. You'll know that this year we have a blended event. We have around 50 buildings in the programme and we're also very glad to see the return of our digital festival. Um, we also, for the very first time, have our own radio station, Glasgow Doors Open Days Radio, is available on our website um, and our uh, the audience development intern, intern has been working on that and you can see an extensive programme of arts programming on there. Um, now on to tonight's event. If you've ever wondered who designed Templeton's Carpet Factory, the astonishing building that dominates Glasgow Green, you'll get your answer tonight. Ewan Kennedy is one of a group of people who believe that William Leeper deserves to be better known and are setting up a society dedicated to his memory. So listen on for the life and work of Glasgow's other architects. I'd just like to invite Ewan in now. Hello, uh, good evening, and I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Welcome to uh, this talk about William Leeper, uh, the leader of the Scottish Gothic Revival. Um, I think everyone or most people in Glasgow have heard about Charles Rennie Mackintosh and Alexander Greek Thompson, and quite a few have heard of characters like James Salmon, uh, the wee troot who designed, among others, the Hat Rack on St Vincent Street and the Lion Chambers on Hope Street. But you've probably got to go to the brochures of estate agents selling extremely expensive houses to find people who've heard of William Leeper. Quite simply, his houses are very human spaces to live in, designed to be welcoming with very clever features like wee nooks and crannies to relax in. But when I tell you, as, as you heard, that he designed Templeton's carpet factory in, in Glasgow Green, uh, or Cottiers in the West End, or the massive sun building at the corner of Enfield Street and West George Street, uh, until recently home to Sartes, rather sadly closed, um, you'll realise that you've been walking past his buildings uh, all your life. Uh, these wonderful Glasgow red sandstone buildings that uh, Professor John Hume calls Jolly Red Giants, and uh, Leeper had a, a big impact on the appearance of our city. 
So I'm going to give you an introduction to William Leeper. I think we'll have the, the next photo of the line drawing of him, Stephen. Um, this is him in slightly more uh, mature period. Um, uh, who was William Leeper? Who he saw himself to be, which wasn't quite the same thing. A little bit about his life, his buildings and his legacy. Uh, well, he was born in Glasgow uh, in uh, 21st May 1839, uh, the son of another William Leeper who ran a private primary school in George Street and his wife, Jane Mellis. And they, of course, only had boys and they fed them into the Glasgow High School. Uh, at uh, school, he would have been brought up on the novels of Sir Walter Scott and the ideas of a baronial past that uh, Scott promoted. Um, I think we have a photo of um, Abbotsford. Uh, I think they're further down. That's Abbotsford there, number three. Um, and um, in stages from 1812, Scott had built himself this utterly extraordinary fantasy palace, I would call it, decorated with turrets and stepped gables. And then in 1822, he orchestrated the visit of King George IV to Edinburgh. We've got a leaf picture of King George IV there, um, looking rather uh, remarkable. Um, uh, an event which, uh, th this event really tartanized the urban middle class of Edinburgh. Uh, for two weeks in August uh, of 1822, the city was full of heraldic banners and pageantry, and anyone who could afford it got themselves dressed up in tartan. The king himself spent the equivalent of £120,000 in today's money on a tartan alone. Um, so by the time Leeper was into his formative years, this great reinvention of the Highlands um, was well underway and it had clearly had a very profound influence on him. Um, and just as Scott had done uh, in his novels, uh, Leeper in his architecture was to combine fact and fantasy, creating buildings that uh, actually worked, but with constant references to an earlier and what one maybe hopes happier world. Uh, in later life, he chose the name Ter Percy for his family home. And he actually claimed ancestry from the Laird of Ter Percy, who had fought for Bonnie Prince Charlie. Um, the uh, otherwise sometimes called Dal Percy it's actually the name of a small tower house in Aberdeenshire built in 1561 and later burnt down by the Covenanters uh, and it was a ruin during Leper's uh, lifetime. Um, if we look at the, the next little uh, trio of stained glass images, um, these are from the house that Leper later uh, built for himself in Helensborough and the WL are actually the initials of his father, William Leper, uh, with a stained glass image of dad. And then the next one is mum, Jane Mellis, um, and uh, how he imagines her to have been in that uh, bar baronial past. And then the JM is Jane's uh, initials, of course, Jane Mellis. Um, so um, if you had any paperwork to back this up, I think it's all been lost. It's maybe just a sign of his wish to connect with the romantic period of Scottish history that he'd first read about in his childhood. So uh, I'm going to give you some basic facts. Um, and first of all, I think the name Leeper is quite interesting. It's a very unusual name. I've done a bit of research on it and tried to find out about them. And the consensus seems to be that it originated in Germany or possibly the, the Low Countries, possibly Holland. In fact, if you put a J in after the I in the L-E-I, if you make it L-E-I-J-P-E-R, you get a recognised Dutch family name. And in keeping with what you would expect from that, uh, most of the Scottish leapers lived around Aberdeen, and that was the case with our man, whose ancestors that we do know about were Aberdeenshire stonemasons. So he leaves school secondary education at Glasgow High School in 1855, and he was determined to become an architect. He became the first ever apprentice taken on by the new practice of Boucher and Coosland, which had started up in business the year before. James Boucher and James Coosland seemed to have been very independently wealthy and well-connected among Glasgow's new industrialists. 
Boucher was in the habit of going off on his grand tours around Europe, studying famous buildings. And he encouraged the young apprentice to do the same. So in 1859, William Leeper took himself off uh, various excursions, but he ended up in London uh, working for John Loughborough Pearson. Uh, Pearson's uh, a, an ecclesiastical architect who was involved in promoting the Gothic revival and specialising in particular in French Gothic. It's quite a controversial figure because he believed in improving and expanding medieval churches. In other words, the medieval people who had uh, originally invented the Gothic uh, hadn't gone as far as Pearson thought they should have done. And he thought he was improving on them. After spending a year with Pearson, Leeper moved on to another revivalist, William White, who's a pretty famous fellow, and he worked with him for a year. And that gave him an entree into the really top circle uh, of these fellows, um, Edward William Godwin and William Burgess, who were also part of this Victorian Gothic movement, which was getting underway. Uh, now, I think if you go back up, uh, Stephen, we'll get a, an image of Findlater's Church. It's th that's it there. Um, uh, after this very thorough grounding that he had, Leeper, and he was still only 24, was appointed by the Perthshire architect, Andrew Hyton, to supervise the building of Findlater's Church in Dublin. Um, the wine merchant, Alexander Findlater, had set aside 14,000 uh, pounds, a huge amount of money in, in today's terms, to construct, would you believe, a new Presbyterian church in the middle of Dublin in what's now called Parnell Square. Uh, I'm not going to expand on the politics that might have been behind this, but uh, it's a most extraordinary building still there the spire is 180 feet high, absolutely dominates the scene, and it features in some of James Joyce's novels. Um, I think this indicated that Leeper, at quite an early age, had established a lot of credibility um, as a, a project manager um, and um, as a, a soon-to-be architect. The church was finished in 1863, and Leeper came back to Glasgow, where he started with a a very pleasant uh, architectural firm of Campbell Douglas and John James Stevenson. They were very highly regarded as a teaching practice. Uh, the firm occupied the ground floor of a townhouse in St Vincent Street and Campbell Douglas and family lived on the upper floors of the building. Um, I get the impression it was a very nice studio atmosphere with the family arranging musical evenings uh, that their assistants were always invited to. And this had quite an effect on Leeper because he also adopted a studio type of practice when he eventually set up on his own. Um, Campbell Douglas um, uh, later went into partnership with James Sellers and they continued training very successful architects, including John Kepi, well-known John Kepi. Uh, so at the beginning of 1864, um, Lee performed a partnership with uh, Robert Grieve Melvin, who had been working for James Smith. Um, and James Smith uh, had um, uh, unfortunately died when the firm was actually working on what's, what became Stirling's Library on Miller Street in the city centre. Uh, Smith was fabulously successful as an architect, lived in Blythwood Square, and uh, some of you might perhaps know him a wee bit better known for being the father of the well-known Madeleine Smith. And you may recall that she was very famously found not proven of um, disposing of her boyfriend with arsenic. Um, so we'll draw a veil over that bit of the history. But um, the, these uh, young men, Leeper and Melvin, fell heir to an extremely successful uh, practice. Um, and now I'll ask Stephen to uh, show us 9 and 10 and 11, uh, because we're now on to Cotiers. Leeper is now 25 years of age, and he entered the competition to design the new Downhill Church uh, in 1864, which is now better known as Cotiers Theatre. Um, he realized a very young chap would perhaps not succeed in the competition. Uh, so he put in two entries under pseudonyms, 
And believe it or not, he won first and second places. Um, his winning design borrowed all sorts of details from his previous experience in London. It drew inspiration from one of Pearson's designs for St. Peter's uh, Vauxhall and also had references to George Gilbert Scott's scheme for St. Mary's at Stoke Newington. And we'll scroll down to the next image, which is the entrance. Um, and it is really pure 13th century French Gothic. Um, and um, the um, number 11 is one of the heads that he put. Uh, we come down to image number 11 there. Um, Leeper is uh, very well known for these tiny little details <coughs> uh, in his buildings. Um, the building itself is, is now best known for its glass and the uh, stencil decoration by Daniel Cotier. And this, I think, raises one of the first issues that I have uh, that I find very interesting about William Leeper. Um, and it's also very interesting about the congregation because it was a United Presbyterian congregation and they are supposed to have a doctrinal aversion to ostentation. They're quite a strict Presbyterian church. Uh, but somehow they decided to award themselves one of the most lavishly decorated buildings around. Apparently when Cotier supplied some of the original stencils, the congregation decided that they would go the whole hog and they would have a lot of wonderful, very highly colored stained glass as well. And um, incidentally, the congregation uh, actually had to build another church down the road in Partick for the working class members of the congregation because they had a rather more doctrinal view of things and uh, weren't, apparently weren't so happy with um, all the colorful images and the celebration. Uh, the building is still very impressive standing at the top of the hill, but I suggest you try to imagine it before any of the tenements down the hill were built. Uh, an incredibly commanding site with a clear view of the river um, right down the hill uh, and at the foot of the, the hill uh, at the River Clyde, there would have been a forest of masts of the sailing ships and some of the wealthy congregation would have interest in those ships and in the shipyards that built them. Uh, so it must have been quite a remarkable uh, establishment. And this brought a lot of commissions. The, the following year brought Leeper Commission for very richly sculptured Dumbarton Academy and Borough Hall. Again, the design for that, he's borrowed from some of the English uh, Gothic architects that he'd been working with, uh, Godwin in particular. Um, this building has recently been brought back to life by Western Bartonshire Council in a project uh, which was supervised by Kepi. And uh, I'd like Stephen to show us number 12, which is the image of uh, Kepi had a, a are still going strong, of course, they're a wonderful firm and they have a wonderful young assistant who created this model uh, of what, uh, what the building was like um, as designed by Leeper. Uh, so by this time, very early age, Leeper was uh, very well established and there was this Victorian craze for Gothic, which was really getting underway. He got a lot of uh, commissions for large private houses in, in the same style. Uh, one of his first was a gigantic house in Dumbarton called Kirkton, Till, Kirkton Hill uh, in 1866. Uh, it's now demolished. And then numerous smaller houses followed. Uh, some of them had towers, some of them didn't have towers. And uh, quite an interesting one is uh, number 13 there. Um, if you could bring up number 13, uh, which is... Um, Castle Park in Lanark uh, belongs to um, a friend of, friend of uh, ours, uh, Peter Tierfelt, who is uh, doing a lot of restoration work. And uh, this is very interesting, uh, Swiss references and some Anglo-Japanese um, Anglo uh, elements in it. Um, the, the partnership with uh, Melville came to an end in 1867, um, not quite sure uh, whether it was acrimonious or not, but for the next 11 years, William Reaper was on his own, and this enabled him to develop his own style. Um, and plainly, this style was uh, very much involved with the Gothic. He was pretty 
obsessed with the Gothic and very much the French Gothic from uh, Francois I. Uh, and this is going back to about 1515 to 1547. And um, uh, that, um, uh, that ruler was responsible really for bringing the Renaissance to France. But, it, but I find it a very strange obsession for a young man who was himself brought up in the United Presbyterian tradition. Um, and this is something I'll explore a wee bit further. Um, as the 19th century went on, the Gothic revival was really very well underway. And um, it harked back to medieval forms and structures, uh, drew inspiration from surviving church buildings throughout Europe. It was part an antidote to the growing industrialization of society, uh, but in England it also reflected a high church Anglo-Catholic reaction to religious non-conformism. And that was exactly really where Leaper came from. So really the architecture that he was practicing was a reaction to uh, his, um, uh, the beliefs that he'd been brought up with. Uh, in, in 1849, John Ruskin uh, had joined the fray with the Seven Lamps of Architecture, which was setting out his views on saving the purity of architecture in the industrial age and really turning it almost into an ideology. Uh, so it is interesting that Leaper's roots were totally outside of all this. And um, we want, it's interesting to speculate on why he wanted to connect with it. And uh, my uh, conclusion, which we might discuss later, uh, was that really his interest is just purely romantic and the fact that he just liked the aesthetic. Uh, there's no indication that he ever actually wrote anything. He didn't write essays or um, really take part in debates about the Gothic. And he wasn't really part of Ruskin's circle. Uh, he just blended his vision of the Gothic with the Scottish baronial, which he got from, as I said earlier, got from Sir Walter Scott and the, the Scott novels. Um, and he produced these fantastical buildings with towers and turrets, often decorated with sculptures. Uh, another big influence on Leaper was Japan. Um, and uh, we see a lot of Japanese art arriving in Scotland. Uh, and I think a lot of it was the result of the involvement of Scottish engineers in creating the Japanese shipbuilding industry. Uh, I haven't researched the extent to which there was a Gothic culture in 19th century Japan, but we do know there must be su superficial similarities between the samurai tradition and, and what we kind of imagine about Scottish clan traditions. I uh, can't really be terribly sure that they ever connected and it seems unlikely that they would have done but there are parallels. Uh, but leaving the, the uh, ideologies aside, the aesthetic blend of these artistic strands was exactly what successful Scottish families were demanding. Uh, I'd also say that Leaper's methods of working also appealed greatly. He didn't just, as a modern architect, would provide a design. Um, he also supervised the projects and he assembled a team of highly experienced craftsmen to build them. Uh, actually, I think we can see um, a reflection of this much later with Charles Rennie Mackintosh, who would enjoy designing furniture for properties. And Mackintosh's wife, of course, would design uh, a lot of artwork and right down to um, uh, even cutlery. And we'll have a look at the next uh, image, please, Stephen, number 14 there, um, of the squad. Uh, this is actually the squad he had for building a house at uh, Glenderool. Um, but Leaper is the, is the chap with the beard looking up and he's got his right hand in a rather uh, symbolic gesture which suggests that I'm the fellow who actually draws the, uh, draws the building. Uh, and his squad look a pretty interesting bunch. Uh, I think they must have been... Uh, quite fun to come across if, if when they were off duty. Uh, clients would get the whole works. They would get the basic building design uh, right through to intricate decorated woodwork and stained glass. And the stained glass often came from Daniel Cotier. Uh, Well-known examples, Colerne and Persia, where Cotier contributed a lot of stained glass with portraits of the daughters of the house. And they also supplied Anglo-Japanese tiles from W.B. Simpson. Uh, 1869, Leeper moved to Helensburgh following the death of his father, uh, which had left him quite a wealthy fellow at the age of 30. 
This is a fairly typical move for anyone in Glasgow who could afford it. We got away from the smoke and disease of the city and there were fast rail and steamer connections. Uh, and also it's nice to get out into the countryside, um, which made Hellsborough very attractive, if you, as I say, if you could afford it. Uh, he started to get lots of commissions for Helensborough uh, houses, and uh, I would take all night if I went through them all. Uh, but I'd like just to show you the next image, which is number 15 there. Um, this is Cairndu, 1871. Um, it latterly became a hotel, and this image, uh, I have to confess, I've pinched online. This is how it stands just now while well, it's waiting to be converted into luxury flats. Uh, but in its heyday, it had lavish, again, Japanese-inspired uh, interiors and a gold ceiling, which is said to survive until quite recently. And the exterior is once again French Renaissance. Um, and this remarkable, astonishing house is built for Sir John Muir, who is the Lord Provost of Glasgow. <laughs> I've got to say, I can't imagine a present day successor, Lord Provost of Glasgow, living in a palace of this, miles away from the city. But there you are, 1871, that's what happened. Uh, 18, the, the next year, 1872, he got the commission for the Partick Borough Hall, another building that you'll walk past and never really worry too much about who the architect was. Um, and um, this gives me the chance to tell you that there are some very interesting people turned up in Glasgow around this time. Uh, the 22-year-old aristocrat Charles Alfred Castel de Bonneville turned up in Glasgow in the wake of the Franco-Prussian War. And he had taken up employment with Campbell Douglas and Cellar, where uh, Campbell Douglas, of course, Leeper had been earlier. And he became a partner there. And um, he uh, had also worked in France with some of the French uh, Gothicists and then also with William White. Uh, so Luper and de Bonville uh, worked together on the party at Barra Hall. Uh, and this very precocious young guy uh, had a, quite a charismatic influence on a number of Glasgow architects, including Hugh and David Barclay, um, he encouraged his friends to visit France, and he really was evangelizing the new Beaux-Arts styles that were developing in France. Uh, and also he persuaded James Sellers, his boss, to take a trip to France with them, which they, was considered remarkable because Sellers was a workaholic who never took holidays. Uh, de Bonville eventually moved on to Japan, uh, and he actually became one of the first Europeans to teach architecture in Japan. So, so that had quite an influence and uh, moved Leeper more into looking at uh, Japanese as well as uh, French. Um, in 1873, uh, Leeper got the commission for Dalmore House, uh, which is um, uh, now also in, in uh, flats. And during this period, he was also working on churches. He did Camp Hill Church in Langside, uh, joined by William Harvey Ross, who uh, actually joined Leeper in 1870 and worked with him until 1876. Um, Leeper continued to enter competitions to design churches. Uh, he entered the competition to design the Woodlands United Presbyterian Church on Woodlands Road. It's now the Free Church. Um, but the assessor, John Burn Burnett, uh, decided just to uh, produce the final drawings himself, but he, he borrowed on what Leeper had done. Uh, didn't really please Leeper very much. And the same thing happened with the Hillhead Established Church, which is actually just up Observatory Road from Byers Road, based on Saint-Chapelle in Paris. Uh, Leeper uh, produced drawings which were remarkably similar to the winning entry, which was James Seller. Um, so he was very, very busy until 1878 when an event happened which shook commercial Glasgow to the core. The city of Glasgow Bank crashed. It became a scandal to rival anything that's ever happened since. The bank's directors were put on trial for fraud. Uh, the consequences for shareholders were absolutely dire. Some of the directors tried to escape in their steam yachts, but they were brought back. Um, 
The bank was not a limited company. It was constituted as a trading partnership so that if you had a shareholding, however small an amount, you were liable to the bank's creditors to the extent of all your assets. Huge number of Glasgow families were completely ruined by this and the commissions for architecture uh, dried up. And Leeper uh, had a solution to this, which is quite radical. Uh, he bailed out of architecture altogether and went to Paris, signed up as an art student at the Ecole Julien, prestigious private school. And he also shared a, a studio with two Scottish artists who were working there at the time, Robert Weir Allen and Arthur Melville. And I asked Stephen to put up the picture 16, uh, which is one of Melville's uh, images, very, very typical work from Melville. Um, so I don't know what Leeper was doing for two years in Paris. Um, it's something to be researched, perhaps. Arthur Melville, what was he up to? He was a very adventurous young guy in his early 20s. He went about having quite risky adventures in the Middle East, occasionally being arrested and accused of spying. Um, his detailed watercolour paintings of the entrances to foreign ports would certainly have had their uses. And I'm just suggesting that if you were a naval captain and you had that image there, you would get a fairly good idea about how to get into that port. Uh, I'm only just uh, suggesting that because I don't really have any evidence, but it is um, a possibility and something to be explored. Uh, so Leeper was in Paris for, for two years, didn't really produce any of his own artwork, but he obviously had a, a, had a perfectly pleasant time. Um, in 1880, he was brought back to Glasgow by Tsar Alexander II. He had decided to have a, a yacht built. The Levadia was almost certainly the largest and certainly the strangest ship to be launched into the Clyde at the time. Uh, there's a model of her in the Riverside Museum, and uh, in, in my childhood, we were told it was Admiral Popov's battleship. Uh, that's only partly true, and I'll take a short detour to tell you about her. Uh, the next image, number 17, um, is the uh, an image of Lavadia in the, not the one in the Riverside, this is the image in, in St. Petersburg, and this is a model that was sent by uh, the builders to Tsar Alexander uh, to keep him happy while the ship was being built. Um, in 1868, some years earlier, John Elder had delivered a paper pioneering, uh, discussing the merits of, of pioneering circular ships of war. Uh, Elder had been involved at the Fairfield Yard, had built a lot of ships for the uh, American South, the Confederate Navy, uh, as fast blockade runners. It's rather a dark part of Glasgow's uh, history, I'm sorry to say. But uh, Elder was aware of the circular monitors that the Americans had built. Um, Vice Admiral Pop Popov, Andrei Alexandrovich Popov, was attracted to the concept and in 1879 appointed uh, John Elder and company to construct a prototype. Uh, but this time the yard was run by Elder's widow, Isabella, an astonishing lady, uh, who took over the shipyard when her husband had died. And she had headhunted William Pierce from the, the Royal Dockyards at Chatham to run the, the company. Uh, the Tsar and his uh, agent Popov gave Elders a completely unlimited budget uh, to build the ship regardless of what it cost, and it had to do 15 knots on its trials. Um, and uh, I'm now going to ask Stephen to take us through the next um, couple of images. This, I, I thought it's nice to give credit to a young friend of mine who built a modern model of Lavadia. Gives you an idea of this extraordinary structure of the ship. Um, Pierce also had a, a design, uh, a model designed that they towed round about Loch Lomond. Uh, and they, they firmed up on the design and this unbelievable ship eventually just managed to secure the target speed of uh, just over 15 knots and they got an enormous price. Uh, Leeper designed the interior of this unbelievable uh, ship 
that's um, the, the model of the ship as we displayed it in the uh, Festival of Architecture in 2016, when we put on an exhibition dedicated to um, William Leeper. Um, so Leeper's now back in Glasgow and uh, has, uh, he's re-established himself. Uh, Lavadia created a huge amount of publicity and he started getting house commissions, uh, mainly in Helensburgh, but also right through uh, the central belt. And then he got this extraordinary commission to, to build, uh, to design and supervise Kinloch Moidart. Uh, so we'll move on to the next, um, we've got four images here. Uh, well, yes, there's Levadia as lit at night. And then we move on to, we move on to Kinloch Moidart. Um, Robert Stewart is an Edinburgh distiller famous for Stewart's cream of the barley. Uh, he already owned uh, Ingleston House, uh, now, of course, the Highland, um, Highland Showground. Uh, he used that as a weekend retreat. But when a 15,000 acre estate at the top of Loch Moidoc went up for sale, he couldn't resist it. Special features were connections with Body Prince Charlie, who was, of course, a Stuart as well. There was a row of seven beech trees commemorating the seven men of Moidoc. Uh, William Leeper, who, of course, as we saw earlier, believed himself to be connected with Bonnie Prince Charlie through ancestry, was the obvious choice to build this gigantic country house full of historic references. Um, the finished house uh, had a ground floor dedicated to outdoor pursuits, gun rooms, storage for gear, for shooting, horse riding, sailing, upper floors, five huge public rooms, a billiard room, 10 family bedrooms, dressing rooms, space for servants, all fully lit by electric lighting from a private Hydro scheme. Just imagine the enormity of the task Reaper had taken on. The site had no road access, there was no local labour able to deliver the required standards of finish, let alone the technologies. Everything arrived by puffer, including the red sandstone, which I think you can see there on the exterior. There's greeny grey stone in between the red, uh, which was actually local. Uh, Whinstone, which was mined uh, in, in the hills behind. Uh, the next image is the uh, image number 22 there, uh, is the kind of remoteness uh, of uh, Kinloch Moidart. Um, the entire workforce would have been pretty much the guys we saw in the photograph earlier on, an extremely competent and trusted bunch of craftsmen. Leeper was very busy elsewhere. Uh, at the same time. Um, and I think the next image is uh, one of the uh, one of the interior images, uh, just a very comfortable large uh, country house interior. Um, now let's have a look at the commercial commissions. I think we need to look at Templeton's. Um, this is impressive. Um, 1888, 1889. Three attempts to get designs for the building approved have been rejected by the Glasgow Dean of Guild because of objections from the local residents of very large houses. Glasgow Green was always going to receive special protection as an extreme example of a dear green place. James Templeton asked William Leeper, what was the most beautiful building in the world? They can't refuse the most beautiful building in the world. And he said, the Doge's Palace. So Mr. Templeton said, right. Right, so one of those. So Leeper was lucky to survive without too much damage to his reputation. The front wall was built independently from the mill that was to go in behind. Uh, and it was nearly complete when it was, the whole thing was blown over by very strong winds on the 1st of November, 1889. Templeton had over a hundred women working on carpets in wooden sheds behind the wall. 29 of them were killed, many more were badly injured. This is truly shocking, even for late Victorian Glaswegians who were pretty tough people. Leeper was able to persuade uh, the um, eventual court of inquiry that his commission had only been to design the frontage. Uh, and for once his own team were not involved in in the rest of the building. Uh, a, a, 
a lucky escape, but uh, not for these wretched women. Uh, and now I'd like to look on a couple of more images of Templeton's here, actually, the sort of detail work that we get, most extraordinary for a Glasgow environment. And actually, in many ways, it looks like a gigantic carpet. Uh, so was there really a reference to the, the, the carpet factory? I think there possibly was. Uh, the next image down here is uh, the sun building. Um, this is pure French Renaissance Gothic, uh, an absolutely classic jolly red giant, a huge red sandstone structure conceived to service the rapidly growing commercial sector. Um, and uh, many of you may know that by 1890, uh, Glasgow uh, builders are running out of the local white sandstone uh, what the state agents nowadays call blonde, um, and red was coming into vogue. And the red stone is much softer. Uh, it also enables the machining of blocks uh, within a factory. They don't all have to be cut uh, on basically on the street. Um, and uh, substantial parts of a building could arrive from where, where the quarries were, uh, down in Dumfries at Locker Briggs. And uh, good railway links were coming to bring the red sandstone into Glasgow. I think there's also a triumph of marketing because the Locker Briggs quarry must have persuaded the architects of the time that this was really the go-to material, uh, but it produces uh, these uh, utterly astonishing buildings uh, that are, uh, I don't like the word iconic, but they're almost really uh, iconic in, in Glasgow. Uh, but this building, the Sun Building, is an incredible mix of state-of-the-art construction. Inside, it has massive steel girders, concrete floors, and believe it or not, one of the first electric lifts in Europe. And of course, the whole building lit by electric lighting, uh, which John Hume tells us was 700 volts uh, direct current. Uh, risky stuff. Um, why it clad the exterior with French Renaissance. Uh, the suggestion is that the directors, this is a, just a shortly after the city of Glasgow Bank had crashed, they wanted the building to make a real statement and, uh, and suggest a feeling of permanence. And what's better than to put something up with a 16th century French Gothic exterior? The building itself is actually very interesting. The, the corner um, leads into the, what was originally the main insurance office with uh, solid teak woodwork, intricately carved woodwork and marble sculpture. Uh, you walked in, gave your details, you were immediately sent through to an adjoining room called the hospital, where there was a nurse who gave you a medical. And while you were in there having your uh, blood pressure checked, a clerk wrote out the policy and they actually calculated the premium. So after about an hour, you could walk out of the office with an insurance, life insurance policy under your arm and you paid the premium and uh, you were insured. I don't think you could beat that nowadays. The upper floors uh, were all let out as commercial premises and Leeper set up uh, his studio in one of them. Great sign of confidence between the client and the architect. Uh, to handle the detailed design work, Leeper appointed the 30-year-old William James Anderson who would until then been working on the Citizens Building in St Vincent Place for Thomas Lennox Watson, and he'd made a name for doing detailed exterior work. Uh, Anderson was an extremely talented young man. Um, he eventually became the first director of architecture at the Glasgow School of Art and was responsible for teaching Charles Rennie Mackintosh. James Salmon was, a, was an apprentice in Leeper's office at the time, so he trained, Leeper, trained Salmon as well. And uh, they, they were all involved in this, in this building. Uh, sculpture on the outside actually won the silver medal at the Paris exhibition in 1900. Um, if you're in West George Street or Renfield Street, the building is currently undergoing extensive renovation. Uh, you'll see that there's a lot of sculpture on the outside. There are medieval green men looking out. There are references to the insurance company with uh, figures of the sun. And on the Renfield Street uh, frontage, uh, you will, at a very high level, you'll find the Michelangelo's tombstone of the Medicis. But of course, it's cold in Glasgow, so 
Uh, these figures are clothed, unlike the ones in the original in Florence. Um, again, like courtiers, when we talk about courtiers, the, the church, I ask you to imagine the, the view down from the, the hillside before the tenements went in. And here you can imagine um, the looking down from Blythwood Square uh, at this building, and you would have seen the, the Medici's uh, tomb. It would have been more or less at eye level, obscured now by the buildings that have been built in later. Uh, and then we're now going to scroll through the next three uh, images, uh, which is the last church that um, Leeper ever did, which is uh, Hindland Church of Scotland, uh, only half a mile or so away from the Cottier's Church. And as you'll see, there's no um, steeple. And the next image there is one of the funny wee monsters that he puts on just to give the congregation a scare. And I think we've got another one there. Yeah. Um, he's just fantastic with these little, little details. So finally, uh, to bring this talk to a conclusion, some reflections on Leeper as a, as a person. Uh, I, I, First of all, his, his, his health. I, I came across a lot of architects literally working themselves to death, uh, and in some cases brought down by factors that were not really the fault of um, uh, themselves. Willie Anderson was one example. A, a building in, in Govan had a nasty accident, and also the, he was involved in the Templeton's disaster, and he unfortunately took his own life. Uh, James Seller. Uh, Sellers died of blood poisoning. He stood on a rusty nail, didn't get it treated. Um, Campbell Douglas was incapacitated uh, due to uh, extreme uh, overexertion. But Leeper also suffered blood poisoning in 1903. Uh, he got poisoned on a building site. Uh, these guys were, didn't just work at the drawing board. They, they were on site. Um, and um, Leeper never really recovered after 1903. Uh, he brought in a, a partner who was a rather wonderful man, uh, William McNabb, um, but they, they produced very few uh, buildings in this period. Argyle Buildings in, in the front at Oban is, is one of them, uh, and, then, um, and then he died uh, in May 1916. Uh, so what kind of man was he? Um, while we're talking about this, we'll just flick on to the last image here of the of the lighthouse. Um, he, he was certainly very highly regarded by his uh, contemporaries as an architect. He, he was an amateur painter. He was a very good draftsman. He was a keen watercolorist. He wasn't, his uh, paintings weren't absolutely earth shattering, but I think he knew that and he was very friendly with other Glasgow artists. Um, he coordinated the Glasgow artists uh, to do the banqueting hall in the city chambers. To get a group of people together on such a project must have taken quite a considerable force of character. Uh, he never married, he didn't seem to have any close relatives. His work revolved around his work colleagues and artistic friends. And as I said at the very beginning, his office had a studio atmosphere. Uh, they went out on cycling tours and they picked wild strawberries and um, had picnics. Um, and his circle of friends included the best-selling novelist, uh, William Black. I should say his books are not quite so well read today. And when Black died in 1900, Leeper designed this uh, quite extraordinary memorial, the only Victorian Gothic lighthouse in the world. So it means that by the time of his death, Leeper had really designed at least one uh, of almost every different type of building. I think that's quite an achievement. Uh, along with a number, I'm not a professional historian, as you probably gathered, uh, but along with some other fanatics, we're trying to give him his own society and we're setting up uh, www.williamleeper.com um, and trying to commemorate this fascinating guy. So I think I'll probably overrun a bit and I'll call a halt at this point. Thank you very much for listening. Ewan, thank you so much for that fascinating talk. Um, you spoke about William Leeper being a, a vibrant member of his community, and I think that really comes across in such a celebratory, such a celebratory portfolio of work. 
Um, if, if anyone has a question at this point, if you'd like to just put it in the chat box or the Q&A, we can field those to you. And um, I was wondering if in your research you'd come across any projects that didn't quite get off the ground, maybe some, um, some plans that were fielded but never really happened. Um, well, I did mention a, a, a few churches where, where other uh, actually very well-known architects seem to have rather, uh, dare I say, pinched leapers ideas. Um, we have a, a quite an interesting thing with Beeper. The, the entire archive was destroyed. Um, unfortunately, the, the last partners uh, are not blaming anyone. I mean, it's just one of the people don't realise the value of things, but they... Uh, William uh, McNabb's son eventually took over the practice and they gave up the premises that they were in. And at that stage, they, all the records, uh, unfortunately, were destroyed. Uh, so that unlike uh, other architects whose, whose practices uh, survived them, um, we don't have a portfolio. Uh, but it is reasonable to suppose that he was entering competitions and somewhere somebody uh, will have um, probably have submissions from him. It's, an, it's interesting that there are avenues for research here, like um, I'd love to get across to Paris and find out what he was doing there for two years. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of scope here for further research. And we've got a question from Claire. Did William Leeper design any small houses? Y yes, uh, depends on what you mean by small. Um, there are some houses in Helensburg which are uh, which you would not describe as grand, but I think by by modern standards you would certainly say they were they were kind of pretty substantial for a, a middle class family. Uh, one of the uh, I can't remember its name, but there's one that was actually a sort of homage to um, Greek Thompson, who was quite friendly with Leeper, and and Leeper's version of a Greek Thompson house. I think is probably a bit more comfortable to live in than the Greek Thompson one would have been because it's a lot smaller. It's got a sort of uh, Greek Thompson inspired frontage. Um, but uh, yes, the, the, there are some uh, smaller houses, but not very many. Um, and from Melbourne, is Leeper commemorated at the Cotier? Um, is Cotier a misnomer for the building? Um, it, it's interesting and um, there might be one or two people from Cotier actually listening in tonight. Um, there's no doubt that Cotier, uh, Cotier got the big international reputation because he went to the States. And uh, I mean, and also he's actually, both guys have actually got quite interesting surnames. Uh, Cotier is uh, an Isle of Man surname. Um, and, um, uh, but uh, there's something quite catchy about both of those names. And, I'm inclined to think that the building could have could have been called Leeper and it could have been called Cotier's. There is now um, uh, Leeper's Attic, of course, uh, which commemorates William Leeper. Uh, you could argue that, uh, well, there's not much point in having stained glass without a building to put it in. <laughs> On the other hand, I think you could also argue that cut of stained glass and stencil work, which is a lot, it's been incredibly well restored. It's an ongoing project, I think, uh, suggests that this building is a bit special because of Cotier. Mm -hmm. So you take your pick. <laughs> um, well, thank you. If there are no other questions, um, then I think we will finish up. Ewan, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this webinar will be available um, to watch on our YouTube channel and our website um, shortly after from tomorrow. Um, so you can uh, send it out to other folks that may be interested in the topic. Um, I'd just like to encourage you, if you're interested in filling in our survey, there is a £100 voucher for our Glasgow local business of your choice. Um, and you can find that survey um, just on our website in the navigation. I um, hope to see as many of you as possible at our in-person programme at the weekend and also at the rest of our digital talks, which there are still tickets for. Um, thanks again, Ewan, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Good night. Thank you.